everyone around the world. Welcome to Icon X Talks, connecting the world and the universe. My name is uh, Professor Martin Thuo, coming to you from North Carolina State on the eastern coast of the United States. I'll be moderating today, uh, and I'm continue, we are continuing the November theme on soft matter, uh, where we have seen uh, Professor Neshev, and today we're going to ha have Professor Willeth from the University of Toronto, and join us next week to hear from Professor Chen, and then uh, the last talk is going to be from uh, Professor Pei. In today's uh, talk, um, our guest speaker, Professor Willer, will be uh, reading and taking most of the time, but after that, we're going to have the panel, and the panel will be uh, Professor Sun, Professor Lee, Professor Chang, and our ex-challenger is going to be uh, Dr. Zhang from Duke University. Uh, let me introduce our speaker today. Um, he, I don't think he needs much of an introduction, but for those who may not know, let me give you a little bit about him. Uh, Professor Wheeler and his BS uh, from Fuman University, a PhD uh, from Stanford, and then he was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at UCLA. From there, he joined the uh, chemistry department at University of Toronto, where he has been uh, cross appointed at, at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering and the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research. He is currently a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair of Microfluidic uh, Bioanalysis. He's the Editor-in-Chief of the Lab on a Chip, the premier journal and the flagship journal in microfluidics. And in 2024, he will co-host a microtask conference uh, as he returns a mixed week way back to Canada since 1998. Professor uh, Will has many, many awards. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, he has been awarded the Royal Society of Chemistry Horizon Prize in Analytical Chemistry, the sci uh, X Microscale Separation Innovation uh, Medal, and Lab on Achieve Pioneer of Miniaturization, the uh, NSAC uh, EWR Stacey Fellowship, uh, among many others. He's also been awarded an uh, Alfred P. Swan Fellowship and Eli Lilly and Company Young Investigator Award in Analytical Chemistry, and also the Can uh, Canadian Society for Chemists, Fred Bimish Award. Uh, he's, uh, he's very passionate about his student, and he's been very fortunate to work with a diverse set of uh, 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 team, and we'll be seeing what they've been doing um, in, in, in their lab in their recent past. Uh, Professor Will, you can now share your slide. Okay. So I am so happy to be here today. Thank you for the introduction, Martin, and thank you, Haisha, for uh, setting this thing up. What a what a wonderful lecture series. Um, I'm very very happy to be uh, a part of it. Today I'm going to talk about some work in my lab uh, about microfluidics, and I know we have a diverse uh, audience. So I thought I would start with some introduction. Um, so microfluidics really describes lots of technologies. It's a, maybe a family of technologies that are used to manipulate fluids uh, in devices with micron length dimensions. That's dimensions smaller than a, a human hair. Um, and there are lots of forms of this technology. I'll review a few of my favorites. Um, the traditional technology for microfluidics is enclosed channels. You can think of them as, as tubes, but they're tubes on a planar substrate, okay? And, and fluid can be moved through the tubes in streams, or fluid can be moved through the, the, the tubes in multiple phases, for example, aqueous droplets in an oil background. Very powerful technology. Another very powerful technology is the flow of fluid through absorptive media. Um, sometimes we in the microfluidics community call this paper microfluidics by patterning the hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions of the paper, you can direct the flow of fluid. I think everyone's familiar with this technique because 
paper microfluidics is the, the engine that drives lateral flow assays, which we have all seen recently in the rapid COVID tests that we've been using. A third type of microfluidics uh, is called digital microfluidics. And in fact, that, this is the, the topic that I'm going to speak about today. Digital microfluidics is like the others, a, a technique that's used to manipulate fluids on these small dimensions. Okay, so all of these technologies, and there are others that I didn't mention, um, have been uh, thought of as being useful for forming labs on a chip. And that's kind of a funny name, lab on a chip, but lab on a chip means that we're going to take all of the processes from a regular laboratory, a chemistry laboratory, a biology laboratory, a laboratory in the hospital, et cetera. We're gonna take analysis instruments, separation methods, um, uh, pre-concentration, any type of step that you would do in the laboratory, you're going to miniaturize and put on a chip. And uh, as Martin indicated, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the editor in chief of a journal with this same name. And I bring this up today because I believe that there are lots of students uh, in the audience uh, and students, I encourage you, uh, if you're working in this area, uh, to consider submitting to our journal. Okay, so digital microfluidics. This is the technique that I'm going to talk about today. Um, as you can see, it's, it's kind of unique. There are no walls, there are no channels, it's an open surface, and the open surface has an array of electrodes, and droplets are made to move around on the electrodes. Now, typically the droplets are not blue, pink, and yellow, as they're shown here, that's just food coloring dye. And typically the droplets don't spell U of T, that's for University of Toronto, that's, that's for effect. One other thing I wanna point out is, I will show some videos and pictures we're typically looking from the top down through a top plate. So there is a counter electrode on a top plate uh, and it is transparent. Okay, so early literature in this area described this phenomenon in terms of, of what's called electrowetting. And I'm showing another movie here to the left. Electrowetting is really, really interesting. So if a droplet is on a surface, like a digital microfluidic device, the shape can be made to radically change by applying a potential across the dielectric layer. So this change in shape is the hallmark of what I would uh, call electrowetting. Um, in my work, I typically think less about shape and more about position because I'm interested in the microfluidics. And in fact, it turns out to be straightforward to predict the position and the behavior of the droplets on the devices while remaining agnostic to shape. Um, so we do quite a bit of uh, uh, lump sum circuit models uh, and some very simple modeling to determine where the droplets are, how fast they're moving. And this, this plot shows uh, a series of electrical measurements that we're making based on our lump sum models comparing them to uh, pictures which show where the droplets are at any given time. Okay, so, so why digital microfluidics? Why is it interesting? Well, for one thing, it's very versatile. Um, uh, it's a technique that's compatible with all kinds of different uh, samples, whether you're working with uh, aqueous buffers, whether you're working with surfactants, whether you're working with biofluids, whether you're working with organic solvents, it can handle all of the above. It's also a very powerful technique for sample processing. In particular, when you combine the interfacial forces that are applied to move droplets around with other forces, for example, uh, one that we and many others in the field have, have used is magnetic forces. So in this video, you can see that we're using magnetic forces to pull magnetic particles out of a droplet. We can then deliver new droplets, and this is a way to success, successively deliver new reagents and samples. And you can imagine how one can build up a, a sophisticated series of steps. 
Okay, it's also a, a wonderful technique for doing parallel scale chemistry. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of this in one of my examples. So it's a, a technique that, that allows us to uh, move reagents in parallel, to split and pool, to do some combinatorial reactions uh, at very small scale. Finally, it's a technique that works with almost any detector, um, including the standard optical detectors that are often used in microfluidics, but lots of other detectors. And I'll give uh, an example of kind of an interesting detector later. Okay, so I chose these examples carefully. Um, I, I would like to say to you that we can look in the literature and find microchannels and paper microfluidics and other types of microfluidics that can do all of this. Okay, so this in itself isn't unique. The uniqueness is, is I have chosen these examples because they're all the exact same device. It's a generic device architecture. Um, and this is, this is a key point. Traditional microfluidics are designed specifically for a specific purpose. Maybe I will have some beads here. Maybe I will have a detector here. Maybe I will have a reaction zone there, but it's built into the design. With digital microfluidics, you have a generic device architecture such that you can use the same space for any number of activities. Um, this really gives the user some flexibility. Here's a movie. At the top left, I'm showing kind of our graphical user interface for programming droplet movement. At the top right, I'm showing a movie in which the droplets are, are doing what they're programmed to do, again, containing dyes to make them easier to see. But you can see other programs in the bottom left and the bottom right. Um, the idea is that you can build uh, a library of operations. Uh, and this is all in the software. So you could say mix, you could say react, you could say dispense, you could say analyze, and you can do these in the software, you can put them in loops, run them multiple times. You can look for particular set points to, to change to a new operation. It really gives the user unparalleled flexibility. Um, and again, I wanna emphasize, this is rare for microfluidics. The traditional microfluidic system, you build the operation into the design. Okay, so, so one other point I'll make about digital microfluidics is it really is on a chip. For better or for worse, with traditional digital microfluidics, we don't have tubes or interconnects or valves or pumps. So it really is a self-contained unit um, in which uh, these processes are run. Okay, so I'm going to, to today I'm going to talk about three stories from my group. Um, these are just examples from my group, and there are other wonderful examples in the literature, uh, but I'm going to talk about these because I'm most familiar with these. So I'm going to talk about using digital microfluidics in chemistry, biology, and medicine. And I'll start with chemistry. And this one is important. My home department at the university is chemistry. I am a chemist. And I've always uh, been interested to see if we could use digital microfluidics for chemical applications. And this has been a wonderful collaboration with a colleague of mine in the department, Professor Andre Simpson, uh, and uh, Ian Swire, who was a graduate student and then postdoc in the group, and Sebastian Bondarek, and who's been a postdoc in the group. And I'm going to uh, go back to an idea that I uh, introduced earlier, Chemists are often interested in creating libraries of products. Uh, and, I, and I have a number of colleagues who are synthetic chemists, and they really work hard to build libraries of different products that they would then like to uh, test for various applications. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think digital microfluidics is an interesting tool to allow us to on the fly program and implement chemical synthetic reactions. So again, this is some work we did. In fact, I should have shown, this is some work I did with another uh, colleague, um, 
uh, Andre Uden in my department. Um, and with Andre, we, we worked on building uh, peptide macrocycles. And at the end of the reaction, uh, we formed uh, libraries uh, of picogram amounts of these products. Now, uh, in, these, in this work, which was, was a few years ago, at the end of the reaction, we had to scrape off the products and walk it over to the detector. So it wasn't a true lab on a chip. Um, but it became clear to us that we really needed in situ analysis. Uh, if you're going to do chemical synthesis, we need to know what's being made, how fast it's being made, um, what the intermediate products are, uh, and so on. So uh, we need sophisticated analysis tools. And one of the tools that my group has spent a lot of time doing is developing interfaces to mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry is a very powerful analytical tool. Um, and and uh, it's, I think, uh, a really nice technique to interface with, with digital microfluidics. But my synthesis colleagues, they like mass spec, but they love NMR. NMR is the tool that chemists like to use to evaluate their chemical reactions because it offers unsurpassed qualitative evaluation of what types of products you're building. So uh, NMR is not a detector that's often used with microfluidics. There are a few scientists who are doing wonderful work in this area Marcel Oots at uh, University of Southampton comes to mind. Um, but digital microfluidics had never been used with NMR. And um, uh, so my team and I decided to see if we could build a digital microfluidic system to put into an NMR to follow the course of a chemical reaction. So here's a, a, a crude picture of one of our earlier early devices. This is this is a probe that's also serving as the top plate of a digital microfluidic device. This is a bottom plate of a digital microfluidic device. If you look closely, you can see electrodes. Um, the point is, is we had very little space to work with here. There was about a, a centimeter and a half um, of space inside uh, the bore of the superconducting magnet in the NMR. So we really had to compress everything into a very small space. I want to emphasize that one of the things we spent a lot of time doing here was developing methods to put uh, the microcoil receiver. You can think of this as being the little radio that's listening to the nuclei uh, in, in the products as they're being reacted. So we call that the, the B1 field that we're measuring uh, from, from the chemical products, and we need the microcoil to be as close as possible to the sample. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, planning, engineering, and then uh, running through iterations of devices to get this to work. The other thing that was quite challenging was simply the practical aspects of how do we get the sample into the NMR and how do we control the sample outside of the NMR. So this really led to us uh, becoming um, much more confident in our uh, droplet control algorithms and, and programs uh, because, uh, of course, we can't be in the NMR with the device watching it. We have to be several feet away um, because it's such a powerful magnet. Okay, so does it work? I think you might imagine that it does. Otherwise, I might not talk about it. It, it works. And... Um, this really is the kind of project that's so much fun because this was sketched out on a napkin uh, at a at a uh, you, you know a local uh, uh, a brewery one day. We we sketched this idea out, so it's really exciting when an idea like this works. So here I'm showing a picture of a device uh, and an NMR spectrum. Now, in real life, we can't take a picture of the device while it's in the NMR. So, so this is uh, just a picture to show you what's happening inside the NMR. So the little yellow circle is where the microfoil is. So when there's no sample over the microfoil, we do not detect any signal. Uh, when we move a droplet of water over the microfoil, we see the protons in water that we would expect. Um, and when we move a droplet of sucrose over the microfoil, 
we see the protons uh, in the sucrose uh, molecule that we would expect. Um, so we can move the, the reagents uh, back and forth, watch the signal, and make measurements. So this is one-dimensional NMR. It also turns out to, to work quite nicely for two-dimensional NMR. This is a a proton proton uh, NMR spectrum, not the, the most interesting. I'll show you a more interesting one in a few minutes. But this was enough to prove to us that, hey, this crazy idea is going to work. So we might be able to do chemical reactions inside the NMR and follow the course of those reactions. Um, one really interesting part of this project that I wasn't expecting is it turns out that the flexibility of changing droplet position and shape is really useful inside the NMR. Um, uh, as, as you may know, NMR depends on applying a very high magnetic field. We call this the b naught field. And we need the b naught field in the sample to be as homogeneous as possible. Well, it turns out that we can change the volume and the, and the direction and the alignment of the droplets quite easily in the digital microfluidic device. And it turns out that we can, we can optimize the geometry. So what I'm showing here are some simulations in which we're simulating the b naught field. That's the, the, the heat map here. And because there's differences in magnetic susceptibility between the droplet and the surrounding of the droplet, um, we see that if the droplet is perpendicular to the b naught field, we see a heterogeneous magnetic field inside the droplet. Whereas if the droplet is parallel to the magnetic field, we see a much more homogeneous distribution of magnetic field. And then just to round this off, the contours here are the B1 field. That's what we're measuring inside the droplet. Well, this is all numerical simulations. I'm an experimentalist, so um, I, I believe it when I see it. And, and it turns out to work exactly like we would predict, um, that when we orient the droplet perpendicular to the field, we see poorer resolution. And the reason we see poorer resolution is that the magnetic field distribution is more heterogeneous. Whereas when we uh, manipulate the droplet to be parallel, to the magnetic field, we see better resolution. So this is an interesting tool. And in fact, the NMR company that we worked with has become very interested in this, as this, this is another tool to give the user um, uh, uh, to play with to optimize their NMR signal. Okay, so I pitched this as a way to follow chemical reactions, and that's that was our goal. So we've we've developed some systems. This is one of the first chemical reactions we followed, a very simple uh, decarboxylation uh, reaction. We can see the protons on the product growing in. We can see the protons on the reactants um, uh, uh, being used up. And uh, the data were a little bit noisy, but I still like to show the first data. They're always the most fun um, in which we're, we're able to follow uh, the chemical reaction as it takes place. Um, as we got uh, better and better at the technique, we, we were able to come up with methods to make measurements with very high sensitivity, um, such that we could, whoops, excuse me, such that we could uh, follow reactions uh, uh, in a matter of seconds. So here's another little chemical reaction that we're following, um, one of many that we've looked at, um, in which we're following uh, the formation of products using up the reagents uh, on a time scale of seconds. So this was quite exciting. This really uh, succeeded, frankly, better than, than I, I thought it would. Um, so this was a really fun project. We're continuing to work with, our, with uh, Andre Simpson and also the NMR uh, company on, on some, some new ideas in this area. I wanna give you just a taste about a new frontier for this technique. It turns out that Andre Simpson is an environmental chemist. So he likes chemical reactions, but he loves making measurements uh, of environmental samples that can provide information about the environmental state, whether there may be degradation as a function of pollution uh, and so on. 
And one of the tools that Andre uses is a keystone species. This is a, a, a common species that's in a particular environmental um, uh, area that is viewed as a reporter for the overall state of the environment. So he works quite a bit with water fleas. They're, they're tiny little multicellular uh, organisms. Turns out that they, they fit right uh, nicely in a digital microfluidic device. We can move the droplets with the water fleas around, and we can put them in the NMR and make measurements of them. So this is a very nice uh, two-dimensional spectrum in which we're looking at protons uh, and uh, carbon-13. Uh, and, and by using this type of analysis, we're able to resolve uh, a whole host of analytes uh, inside the, the, the living water flea. And I'll show you just a little bit of data here. So here's on the left is a water flea uh, whom we have treated very nicely. We regularly bring fresh droplets of water to this water flea. So uh, this water flea has lots of, of fresh water to swim around in. The spectrum on the right is a water flea in which we've left him in the same droplet for, uh, for many minutes without replenishing uh, the droplet. And as you can see, as the water flea uh, 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 experiences this, the, the waste products build up around him uh, and we start to see a sign of stress, which is the buildup of lactic acid. So this is exciting and this is ongoing work that I'm uh, doing with, with, with Andre Simpson. This certainly wasn't uh, our original goal, and, and it's one of the fun things about science is, is you, you take a step, uh, you take a chance. If it works out, new ideas uh, are, arise that, that uh, you, you couldn't have dreamed of before. Okay, so that's my story about chemistry. I, I love that story, and there are other uh, stories about chemistry, but I'm going to completely change gears now and talk about a story uh, related to biology. And this has uh, been an ongoing project in my lab for, for many years. I'm very fortunate to work with a, a strong team. Julian Lamana uh, was a PhD student who graduated a year ago. Erica is a postdoc currently in the group. Uh, and Harrison is, is, a, is a graduate student in the group. Um, so uh, there, of course, biology could mean anything. I'm going to talk very specifically about the vast interest these days in isolating single cells and sequencing them. And you may be aware that there, a revolution has occurred in the past decade. 10 years ago, no one was sequencing single cells. Now it's almost becoming routine. Why? Because of microfluidics. Um, uh, Microfluidic uh, researchers, certainly not me, this is, this is others in the community who are doing amazing things, have come up with several different techniques to partition, partition single cells into containers. And in these tiny containers, we can do the chemical reactions required to set up um, uh, a sequencing analysis. So I'm showing some early work from the Waits group um, there are several products that rely on micro wells. And of course, kind of the old standard in, in microfluidics is uh, forming uh, individual uh, micro chambers inside the, the channels. Uh, so again, I don't think it's an overstatement to say these techniques have driven a revolution, which is so exciting. Uh, when I go talk to my colleagues in the life sciences who uh, wouldn't know uh, microfluidics from left from right, they're using it. They're using it to do single cell sequencing. Um, these methods are fantastic, but when we looked at them, um, uh, they weren't able to answer all questions. And I think that's quite reasonable. No technology is, is a panacea for all questions. Uh, and we thought of some questions that we would like to see if we could answer. For example, we would like to couple these powerful techniques with the capacity to select the particular cells to be sequenced. We would like to, to couple these methods with an ability to characterize the phenotype of the cells. So for example, how many neighbors does the cell have? What kinds of neighbors does the cell have? How far away are those neighbors? 
Uh, what proteins are the cell expressing on its surface? Typically, this kind of information is not compatible with the sequencing experiment. Um, and then finally, we'd like to give the user the flexibility to use whatever omic analysis method he or she wants to use. Um, and uh, so, so these these are these are big questions that we certainly were not sure we could answer them. But this led us to develop a technique that we call digital microfluidic isolation of single cells for omics. Uh, that's a mouthful, and of course, we we decided on this mouthful because it has a nice name, DISCO. So DISCO is, a, is the technique that we use to try to answer the questions. Okay, so what do we do with DISCO? Well, the first thing we do with DISCO is we culture our cells. So here's a cartoon. This is actually from a previous paper, but it's, a, I think, a nice illustration. It's a cartoon illustrating how we uh, dispense droplets onto the device. And then we take advantage of an interesting phenomenon where, uh, depending on the surface energy uh, of regions in the device that we'll call hydrophilic sites, we can um, uh, realize a phenomenon called passive dispensing. So if you follow this movie, you'll see droplets passing over hydrophilic sites and spontaneously leaving behind very uh, precise metered amounts of fluid behind. So this turns out to be a, a nice way to seed cells and then to deliver reagents to cells. This cartoon is showing where the cells are. Uh, you'll notice our hydrophilic site is on the top plate um, and the cells are growing on the top plate. I want to emphasize that we call it the top plate, but in real life, it's flipped upside down. So in real life, these, these uh, droplets can settle by, the, excuse me, the cells can settle by gravity and adhere uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the sites on the surface. Okay, so once we have uh, seeded our cells and we've grown our cells and maybe we've done immunohistochemistry on our cells to see um, which cells are expressing which proteins. Now we're ready to see if we can do a sequencing experiment. So um, in this case, we've uh, adopted a technique similar to laser capture microdissection. So we take uh, a high energy, high frequency focused laser and we focus the laser um, and shoot two or three very short pulses of energy, um, enough energy that causes um, a, a very small bubble to form, which rapidly expands and then collapses. This is a, a, a fair amount of mechanical energy that's enough to lyse a cell that's in the vicinity. So here's a, a picture in a cartoon showing how this works. So we have cells on the surface, we focus the laser, we lyse the cell of interest. Now we have the contents of that cell in the droplet. The rest of the cells are unperturbed and we can bring a new droplet and collect the next cell's content. So this is just a picture of some cells. These are GFP labeled cells and uh, M cherry labeled cells. And you can see how we're picking just the GFP labeled cell in this case. Okay, so here's a little movie. Um, these are uh, some uh, some live cells, and, and in this case, we decided we needed two shots to lyse the, this particular cell. Uh, but depending on the state of the sample, we can do lots of different things. For example, sometimes we work with fixed cells, uh, and with fixed cells, sometimes we end up kind of uh, rastering out a pattern around the edges of the cell to get it into the droplet. Um, and the, the thing we noticed when we started is this is fairly slow. This is kind of like playing a video game. The, the, the student or postdoc is using a joystick and choosing the location and then uh, pressing start on the laser and so on. It's, it's a fun experiment, but it's a fairly slow experiment. So one of the other things that we've spent a lot of time doing is developing artificial intelligence algorithms that allows the system to find the cells itself and in fact, choose uh, interesting cells depending on characteristics fed in by the user. So, um, so we've developed some convolutional uh, neural networks. This is this is an older one that we've developed. We're now using uh, several generations uh, uh, advanced um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms that allow the system to quickly scan all of the cells, find some interesting candidates, and then. The system can uh, drive the droplets uh, to where uh, 
to where we're doing the lysis all automatically. So I'll show an example of this. Here's a movie. If you look at the left, you'll see a cell that we've lysed. If you look on the right, if you look closely, you can see the droplet being pulled away. So we're operating at a rate such that we can collect lysates of uh, hundreds of cells per hour. Now, I wanna emphasize, this is still fairly slow. It's certainly a lot slower than some of the, the techniques that Dave Waits and uh, 10X Genomics use. Um, uh, but we think it's, it's a high enough rate to, to generate enough data to do some statistics. And again, we're getting the advantage of being able to know the spatial phenotype of the cell to couple with um, the, the sequencing. Okay, so let's talk about sequencing. What can we do? Well, we can, we can take the droplet uh, and we can sequence the droplet using whatever technology we want. For example, we can certainly do next generation sequencing and look at the chromosomal DNA. That's a, a powerful technique. Um, uh, and and, and uh, I'm just showing a little bit of data. This is low resolution, but of course we can drill down to much higher resolution. This is low resolution looking at the chromosomes uh, in a bunch of single cells and also some bulk analyses. What's interesting with these in vitro cultured um, uh, uh, cancer derived cells, they're really messy. As if you look through the chromosomal data here, you'll see that some of these cells have big chunks of chromosomes missing or they have extra pieces of chromosomes. Uh, so, so again, these immortalized uh, cell lines that, that many of us use. Um, are, are quite messy. And I think it's important to know that and to know about the heterogeneity that one finds in these systems. Okay, so that's single cell genomics, but of course we can also do transcriptomics. This is where the biologists get uh, really interested because we can start learning about the state of the cell right now. We can look at the, pro the, the um, uh, RNA products that are being uh, 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 generated. So here's a, just a, a small data set. These are all single cell. Each row is a single cell. Uh, and and um, this is a heat map of just a bunch of genes, not all the genes, but some, some genes that we thought were interesting. Um, if we uh, culture a cell uh, around members of its own kind, we see one phenotype. And as you might expect, if we culture a cell, this is uh, a mouse cell surrounded by some human cells, we see a very different phenotype. It turns out when the mouse, mouse cell is surrounded by um, uh, human cells, uh, uh, its, its stress, stress genes go way up and its tissue integration genes go way down. Um, uh, and, and again, this depends uh, on how many cells it's next to and so on. This is, this is a really interesting type of question that only a tool like DISCO can explore. Um, finally, but we don't need to do next generation sequencing. Um, and, and in fact, I think this is one of the real flexible aspects of this technique is that we can we can use any sequencing technology and, and one that my group has spent some time working on, as I indicated before, is mass spectrometry. The latest mass spectrometers these days are so sensitive. One can drill down and see uh, proteins in single cells. So um, in fact, this is the signal that we get from a single uh, cell. This is the total ion chromatogram. Here's a primary mass spectrum, secondary mass spectrum. Um, from this, we can go in and we can identify the particular proteins that are being expressed. Now, we can't see all of the proteins. Right now, we're up to hundreds of proteins. I think soon we're developing some techniques that will get us to thousands of proteins. Still, that's not at the level of uh, next generation sequencing for nucleic acids, but it's getting better and better. And um, there are a lot of folks, uh, it turns out, who are interested in these kinds of techniques. Okay, so, so we wanted to do a proof of concept to look at the interplay between phenotype and genotype. Um, and we decided to look at CRISPR heterogeneity. This is another uh, superstar colleague, uh, Jason Moffat, is a CRISPR expert and a molecular biologist uh, at the, the top of his game. And um, uh, Jason regularly will use CRISPR to go in and knock out or silence particular genes. Um, but it turns out that it's a very heterogeneous process. So here's a, 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 an immunohistochemistry uh, stained um, uh, picture of cells that he's working with we see some of them are wild types. Some of them haven't been knocked out. Some of them have been knocked out. And it's kind of interesting to see 
see this heterogeneity. And of course, with a cool tool like Disco, we can go in and pick cells. We can pick wild type cells. We can pick knocked out cells. And here we decided not to use next generation sequencing, but uh, uh, to do uh, regular old Sanger sequencing because we wanted to drill down to the single base pair level. And, and it's you know very interesting. You can see in some cases we've knocked out a, a single base pair. In other cases, we've knocked out huge sections of the chromosome. Um, so there is a lot of heterogeneity. And of course, this is why uh, in, in Jason's work, he would pick one of the cells and would uh, do a, a clonal expansion but, but, because otherwise you have this whole mismatch of, of different um, cells. So this is exciting. We have lots of ideas, just very briefly. One of the things we're working on right now, I don't have data to show you yet, but I think we are so close uh, to being able to get proteome uh, and transcriptome from the same cell. And I think that's gonna be a game changer and it's gonna be quite exciting. But I'm just showing you a cartoon here because uh, as of today, I, I, we don't have it working, but, but we are working on it. Another thing we're doing is um, we're, we're picking cells from tissue. So we've worked uh, quite closely with Cindy Morshead. Uh, she's a famous neuroscientist in town. And uh, Cindy Morshead uh, takes very uh, thin uh, dissections of brain tissue. And she's really interested in the interplay of, of what the neurons and the astrocytes and, and other cells in the brain tissue are doing. So uh, it, uh, it, it took some work, but we've developed techniques that work quite nicely with with uh, tissue sections, and we're now regularly collecting um, sequencing data. So that's, we have a whole pile of data. That's a, a story for another day. Um, and then finally, we, you know, my group fundamentally is a technology and tools group, and we've, we've developed the next generation of our DISCO system that's almost completely automated. So the user very close can put the sample in and press a button. Um, and, and we're going to continue to improve this because we, we think this is when the real power of the technique um, uh, will, will show itself to be able to offer the user um, this self-contained end-to-end uh, uh, experience. Okay, so that's biology. In the last few minutes today, I'm going to talk about another very different application with very different constraints in the area of medicine. And of course, medicine could mean all kinds of things. Here, I'm going to talk about a, a very specific goal that's been of interest to the microfluidics community for a long time. Um, I'm showing some pictures. This, uh, all of this work has required big teams of people. That's, that's certainly how we approach uh, science. So I'm, I'm showing pictures of a few key players, but, but I don't have enough room to show everyone. In particular, for this case, we've worked with tens, probably close to 100 scientists on, on each uh, project. So I'm just showing a small snapshot of a few members of my team um, with, with Amy Summers from the Centers for Disease Control and, and uh, Prevention. Okay, so the, the, the medical problem that we're interested in is developing integrated portable devices, right? So this isn't a device with an NMR or a mass spec or next generation sequencing. This is a portable small device that we're gonna take in the field and make measurements um, that are useful for medical diagnostics purposes. And of course, this has been an important goal um, uh, for many years. And in particular, the community has been really interested in taking these systems out into the field into places um, that are far from um, uh, medical infrastructure. So, so kind of remote locations. And I'm gonna point out really the pioneer and the person who has set the, the pace for the rest of the community here is uh, Sam Sia. Um, this was a, a paper, this, this was the first time I ran into this idea from 2004, Sam Sia when he was in the Whitesides group. And Sam has gone on to really realize this dream in a, in a wonderful way. Um, however, I do think the idea has been a bit oversold uh, and if I could talk to the students, students, when you write the paper, don't oversell. Um, if 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 you're you're working on a technique that may someday be useful for point of care diagnostics, that's great. But say that don't don't 
don't overclaim what you're doing. And and I'm I'm very sensitive to this. I don't ever want to claim more than what I'm doing. So when my students came to me and wanted to work on this project, frankly, this this project was completely driven by my students. I I I uh, had a sense of how complicated it was going to be and argued against it, but I got outvoted. Um, I, I did insist that if we're going to work on this project, we absolutely cannot sell it until we've actually taken um, the, the, the samples into the field. So I'm going to start off here by showing you some work towards point of care diagnostics, and then I'll conclude uh, with, with our actual point of care remote setting diagnostics. So uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this primarily to show you how much work went on in the background to get to where our techniques could work. Okay, so this is all lab work, just uh, trying to develop the techniques to get them to work in the lab. So uh, I've shown a couple of times, I've shown a movie. Uh, here's, a, here's a schematic of how we use magnetic particles to uh, pull down products uh, in, uh, in droplets. Uh, let's see, here's a picture. So, so uh, again, uh, we use a magnet to pull the particles down. We can pull away the first reagent. Maybe the first reagent is the sample. Uh, maybe the next reagent is uh, shown here is the conjugate. Maybe the next reagent is the substrate. The next reagent may be an adjuvant to the substrate. So um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, complicated stepwise procedure, but it can all be automated in droplets. This is a, a really wonderful format because it's appropriate for almost any type of assay that you want to do. For example, if you want to do a traditional sandwich style immunoassay, um, this is a very nice format. Uh, if on the other hand, you want to do a competitive assay measuring labeled analyte versus unlabeled um, biogenic analyte, uh, it's also a very nice format. And over the years, what we've learned is that most assays that we can do in kind of macro scale using conventional techniques, we can port to the digital microfluidic format. That doesn't mean it's easy. And in fact, there's often quite a bit of optimization required, but, but it, it, it is possible. Um, another thing that we thought carefully about is how to engineer these things so that we can run samples in parallel. So we've, we've done quite a bit of work thinking about how to deliver the magnetic fields to the devices. For example, this is, this is uh, showing how we're pulling uh, particles out of eight samples simultaneously. And um, this is, uh, again, the capacity to run multiple samples simultaneously is, is fairly unique for, for portable methods that could be used in the field. Um, and again, I, I mentioned optimization. I want to I want to talk about it. You, you see the papers in the literature, and you see the final results, and they're so wonderful. There's always so much optimization work that's required. And, and one of the things we've we've been using chemometrics for several years to help steer us towards the right conditions for uh, the. For example, in this case, we're showing signal over background ratio, trying to find the the right combinations of conditions to enable that. Um, the devices, of course, as I've mentioned, can be used for any kind of detector. I'm showing an example here. We actually didn't use this in the field. They're, these are kind of difficult to fabricate, but they're really cool. This is work with Shana Kelly, who is recently a colleague here now at Northwestern, uh, in which we use her fancy um, nanostructured uh, microelectrodes to make electrochemical measurements. Um, very exciting. Um, uh, so, so electrochemistry is a nice option, but the data I'll show you today was uh, measured with chemiluminescence. Um, let's see. So what else? We, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to get the sample in the device. This is a movie of my, my student, Chris Dixon. You can see we're, we're doubly protected from the blood. Um, uh, uh, and he's uh, taking a, a pinprick of blood and delivering it directly to the device. The blood wicks into the device on a, on a paper substrate. And then as shown here, we can take the droplet to pull analytes out of the blood. In fact, this is uh, essentially dilute plasma that we're, we're pulling uh, into the, the sample to analyze. And then finally, we've had to think about price because uh, you know I can afford to, to manufacture a few devices for lab work uh, if the devices are expensive. I can't afford to manufacture hundreds or thousands of devices 
using very expensive techniques. And that's what's required for field work. So we've thought a whole lot about how to reduce costs. The, the best method we've come up with so far is an inkjet printing method where we inkjet print our electrode pattern. We use a roll coding technique. And in fact, we're, we're currently scaling this up to a roll to roll process where it's all in line. And, and the, the resulting device can be formed for uh, less than a dollar. So this is this is how we're able to do these projects outside of the lab. So in terms of outside of the lab, um, uh, we had the good fortune to run into scientists at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they were really interested in uh, testing for uh, measles and rubella immunity. Now, this is interesting. This was before COVID, before we've all thought so much about immunity. But at the time, I, I wasn't thinking about why we would need to, to know the immunity of a population. Uh, but this is, this is what CDC is passionate about. So we set about uh, to develop the techniques. Um, uh, one of the things we had to do is we had to develop a, a box that was inexpensive and very rugged that we could take out in the field. This is a movie showing uh, an undergrad in the group at the time, Afik, uh, manufacturing uh, one of the, the, the boxes that we called the MR box. Um, and uh, yeah, he could do it in about, I, I think, eight hours or so. We also spent a lot of time thinking about how to label and keep track of our devices. So we ended up using a nice QR uh, code system. Um, our lab results looked really good. You know, we can make almost anything happen in the lab. It, this is just uh, some, some calibration curves for the analytes that we're measuring. And here's the reason that CDC wants to know immunity. So they're working with displaced populations. This is a picture of Kakuma refugee site, Northwest Kenya. A lot of folks from South Sudan, the population is always changing. So we don't know exactly who's there. Some have been vaccinated. Some have had the disease. Some haven't. So there's varying levels of immunity. And what CDC really wants to know is they want a snapshot in time, who, how, what proportion of the population is immune and what proportion is not. And of course, the traditional take the samples, take them to the centralized lab, make the measurements, and then come back and act on that information is way too slow and also quite expensive. So the idea that we could make measurements um, uh, in the field and have the information available immediately was quite attractive to them. Um, so we, we set some dates uh, that co coincided with the national vaccination campaign. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll just emphasize, this is a work that requires contributions from so many different folks, not just scientists. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have lots of experience working with scientists. I have less experience working with government bureaucrats, um, uh, national laboratory, uh, national health uh, association laboratories in, in other countries. This, this really was a, a challenge socially as well as, as scientifically, but, but it was also very rewarding and, and a lot of fun. Um, so, so just a long story short, the, the, the team conducted uh, a couple hundred assays. Um, the digital microfluidic format we found to be really important. You know, we had some reagent challenges. So being able to swap out and, and uh, change reagents and change reaction times uh, was critical. Uh, also the capacity to on the fly decide which sets of tests we were running was useful. Um, and our data were quite good. These are receiver uh, uh, operator curve uh, data. Um, you know, we're area under curve 0 0.9, 0 0.86, not perfect, um, but certainly much better than the other tests that were available at the time, which were no tests at all. Um, so this was our first shot. We then moved on to a second field trial. We still haven't published this data yet. You may remember COVID happened and that slowed everything down. Um, but there was a big measles outbreak, uh, just hundreds of deaths per year in Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, you, this, this we're actually not in a refugee site, so we don't have to take a plane uh, operated by the UN to get there. Um, but you may know DRC um, uh, is this gigantic country, and it's just a lovely country, by the way, in Central Africa, but it has very few roads, you know, 2,800 kilometers of roads. So really every place in DRC is fairly remote. The only way we could get to the sites uh, was to get in four-wheel drive vehicles operated by the U.S. government to get to the sites. 
Um, we, we went to sites with uh, suspected measles outbreaks. The CDC uh, set up a little tent for us. And, and in this case, we did all of our uh, operation outdoors. Here's a couple members of my team. Here's um, my team, but more importantly, with the, the local team on the ground that we just had a great time working with. They are really fantastic uh, uh, scientists and, and creative and energetic. It was so much fun. Um, let's see. So it took forever to get the data. In fact, we we haven't gotten all of it, but we've gotten gotten uh, a lot of the um, lab test data. And again, our methods look look quite useful, uh, look look reasonable. Um, not perfect, but but look reasonable. I see Martin telling me that I should should finish up here, so I'm I'm nearly done. Um, so uh, so thank you, Martin. So so this this is what we've done. Uh, for for point of care diagnostics, um, uh, I want to want to highlight one other thing. So we learned a lot from this, and and we recently published a review article. And I thought I'd show just a little bit. We we worked with a wonderful collaborator, Kevin McHugh at Rice, who who develops um, uh, therapeutics and, and has thought a lot about de delivering therapeutics in remote settings. And um, we, we saw that there were some similarities and some differences with diagnostics, and we thought that would be an interesting paper. So if interested, take a look at it. Um, there are challenges. There are opportunities. Um, it's a really, really important problem and, and one, one that I enjoy working on. I think the very best way to work on this problem is, is for uh, local folks uh, in, in the region of interest to develop and run these assays. And I know um, that there's a lot of interest right now in that. And uh, for example, Lisa Hall at Cambridge has been a, been a leader in, in trying to help promote that type of activity. Okay, so I've, I've talked about solving problems with digital microfluidics. I've talked, given an example in chemistry, biology, and medicine. These are just examples from my group. You, as a scientist, are working on very interesting things, maybe much more interesting than this. Um, so, uh, so I would encourage you, if digital microfluidics could be useful, um, uh, give it a try. Um, uh, there, there's, there's lots of uh, ways to do this. We've developed an open source system called Dropbot. You can make your own. I encourage you to give that a try, or you could purchase one. Um, uh, and and uh, I think it's a, a technology that's a little bit underused at the moment. Um, and there could be some really exciting creative, creative ideas that you have that I've never thought about that would be so much fun to see happen. Um, beyond digital microfluidics, of course, I'm passionate about microfluidics of all kind and methods related to microfluidics. And I just wanted to give one quick shout out to a, 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 a former postdoc who's now a professor at Beijing Institute of Technology, Shui Long Zhang. Such a creative uh, scientist. I really had fun working with him. We did a lot of work using a technology called optoelectronic tweezers, which is a nice complement to microfluidics, a, a way to control particles um, within fluids. Um, uh, so whether you use microchannels or lateral flow or digital microfluidics or optoelectronic tweezers or many other techniques, um, I think this is a really exciting area to work. I look forward to seeing your story at the next ICANX, um, and, and do drop me a line about submitting to Lab on a Chip. Let me quickly acknowledge my research group. This is my, my current group. They're, they're so fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not showing any of the, the slightly older uh, members of the group, um, but, uh, but this is the current group. We have so many good collaborators. We've had some nice funding over the years. With that, I will thank you for your attention and I look forward to the panel discussion. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wheeler. Fantastic talk, amazing uh, development there. And uh, I believe you have a lot more stories to tell about flying from Nairobi to Kakuma. I'm from that area of the world, so, so I understand the challenges. Great. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we will now switch um, over to our panel and our, our first panelist is uh, Professor San from the uh, University of Texas at San Antonio and uh, a brief uh, intro about uh, Professor San. He's currently an assistant professor in biomedical engineering and chemical engineering. Uh, his uh, work is in, in, in fundamental electrokinetic and interfacial phenomena 
in microfluidic systems and the application of indices prevention and therapeutic uh, biomanufacturing and systems engineering. Uh, uh, Professor San received his PhD from University of Notre Dame, and then uh, he moved on uh, to work with uh, uh, Professor Chang. Um, and from 2017 to 2022, uh, he worked on his first uh, postdoctoral fellowship and then was a research scientist at Georgia Institute of Technology in uh, Professor Lu's lab. And then from there, he moved over to uh, his new position. All right. Um, our next panelist is um, Professor Hui, um, Hui Li. Professor Lee is uh, an assistant professor in School of Electrical um, in, and Computer and Biomedical Engineering at Southern Illinois uh, University in Carbondale. He was a postdoc at John Hopkins and got his PhD from Penn State. Um, his, uh, his research work centers on developing microfluidic devices toward uh, precise uh, disease diagnostic and management and high throughput uh, drug screening. He's very well. Uh, he's very well published with uh, great papers uh, ranging from science advances, PNAS, and uh, Nature Biomedical. The next uh, panelist is uh, Professor Boyce Chang. Uh, professor Chang is uh, currently an assistant professor in uh, material in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Iowa State University. His, his work is uh, focuses on synthesis and self assembly of soft matter at the nanoscale. Uh, specific topics include molecular design of complex building blocks for hierarchical uh, assembly. Dr. Chang, uh, uh, Professor Chang got his PhD from uh, the same department where he's a professor in, in 2018. And then after that, he moved to UC Berkeley, uh, where he worked with uh, Professor Tang and then shifted uh, to the Barclays National Laboratory. He has worked not only in the US, but also in uh, France, where he uh, was a research, he got a, he had a research fellowship uh, from the French uh, Center for Scientific, National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, and also has worked with the, um, with the um, Critical Material Research uh, Institute at Iowa State. <clears throat> uh, last but not least, our Icon X uh, challenger today is uh, 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 Dr. Zhang, who just got his PhD uh, from uh, uh, Professor Huang's group at Duke University, just up the road from us here. He received his BS in microelectronics from Peking University, and his research is on acoustophilics for small model animal and biological nanoparticle man manipulation. And with that, uh, I will, um, because we have a larger panel, I'll skip the uh, questions from the audience and we can jump straight to um, the, the panel as I, I, I anticipate that we're going to have quite an interesting discussion. Uh, for the panel discussion, we'll start with uh, our ex-challenger, uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, please ask your questions. Hey, uh, thank you so much for giving us such a wonderful talk, Dr. Baylor. Your figures and videos are so beautiful and also a very nice work kind of talk. So uh, for digital microfluidics recently, I remember there are many other methods has been implemented to control the droplet, such as acoustic wave or use some PMS uh, variables or use acoustic uh, field. So in your work, I see you mainly implement the uh, electric field to manipulate the droplet. So uh, my question is in your opinion, what has the special advantages and disadvantages to use electric field to control the droplet uh, compared to other uh, external force field? Jin Shin, this is such a good question and I'm glad you raised it. There are so many cool technologies that are being used to make digital microfluidics work these days. And uh, that's one of the fun things about being at Lab on a Chip is each day I see, I see a new one come in um, I think there's great promise for acoustic methods. I've seen some interesting things where, where people are, are shaking uh, devices in which there's surface patterns that will direct droplets to, to particular points. I think there's some real promise to these techniques. The, the reason that we've stuck with electrical is um, that 
Uh, it's fairly mature at this point and, uh, and it works quite well in our hands. And we're often quite interested in the application side. Um, uh, but but I, I think these, these other uh, tech technologies, as they mature, are going to have some real advantages, you know, um, if, if there if there were there, some some disadvantages of electrical, you know, I need a I need a pretty big battery to bring with me into the field to operate uh, my current system. Um, if if you could find a way to do that in a much less power hungry way with one of these other techniques, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, there are some limitations to the complexity of the devices that I can form inexpensively. Um, uh, now we, you know, we can go in the clean room and make anything, but but in terms of making the devices inexpensively, there's limitations to how many, you know, the pattern and the geometry and that kind of thing. So, so I think some of these other techniques are not limited in that way. Um, uh, there's there's some work in which in which you you have a it's similar to optoelectronic tweezers. There's no patterned electrodes, but you use light to turn on virtual electrodes. That's a very attractive technique um, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, having very simple substrate, but being able to do complicated things. So I think there's just, I think we've just scratched the surface. And by we, I mean the community. Um, I think the surface has just been scratched. And I think there's, there's so much exciting innovation uh, to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us some uh, insights on other technology. And I think your application will is so wonderful and it definitely will help help other people on the world. Thank you. Very good. Any other question? Oh, is that it? Okay. All right, we go to the panelists. Anybody from the panel want to jump in? Yeah, so maybe uh, I can start it off. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Wheeler, for the, the wonderful um, presentation and it really show us a gallery of uh, different work on the digital microfluidic side. And I found this always interesting. Um, one interesting aspect about microfluidics is the uh, constant new uh, fundamental phenomena that we can discover when we implement things uh, in the micro scale, uh, both on the physical side, on the chemistry side, and on the biology side. So I want to ask two questions related to the fundamental aspect of your work. Um, one is related to the digital microfluids in the uh, NMR application, and I found it's very interesting that you can tweak the shape of the, uh, the droplets to change the field distribution. Uh, uh, and then imp uh, improve the sensitivity of uh, NMR. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering, does the shape of the, the droplets, especially the interface between the, um, the liquid and the air, uh, can amplify or change the distribution of the analytes? And then in turn to change uh, maybe the reaction kinetics. Uh, and then have you thought about, uh, you know, um, to study the interplay between the surface um, in the interface uh, as enhanced the reaction versus uh, the NMR uh, sensitivity and use that to maybe uh, study the new uh, reaction kinetics uh, related to catalysis, for instance, or the um, other um, uh, new reaction that had can never been probed before with other technique. So that's one related to your chemistry application. And the other one with the uh, uh, DMF um, in biology, and I found interesting is uh, the way you uh, extract um, single cell genetic materials to do sequencing. And I found interesting in your method is that the uh, virtual microware in your case is about in one to two millimeter scale, right? Uh, and the uh, single cell length scale is probably three order of magnitude smaller than that. Um, and so I wonder, once you release the genetic material from the single cell and extract them, is there a dilution factor that, uh, and also probably some leftover from the hydrophilic side when you extract those materials for the sequencing? And if that's the case, um, is there any implications in uh, in sequencing results, especially when you look at the transcriptomic sequencing? And if you want to study the down, you know, down regulation or um, the expression of rear uh, uh, genes, uh, how do you account for that challenge in your um, uh, study? So that's my question. Thank you. Oh, that is a multitude of questions. They are such good ones. Let me. Let me try to remember. Um, so, so I think the the questions about what we could do with this technology to enhance the NMR signal are 
so interesting. What I showed was very crude, you know, orient the droplet this way versus that way. But I think you're exactly right. I think um, the interface between the fluid in the droplet and the surrounding medium, which as you indicated for, for our experiments was air, um, has, a, has a profound effect. One of the other things we're thinking about, we've done a little bit with, but not, not enough really to come to conclusions about is using a, an oil medium that matches the susceptibility. Um, that, that solves some of the problem, but, but still there, I think there are advantages to be gained at the interface. And I think um, there are some very fundamental questions probably would be better for someone like you to, to answer than me. Um, uh, but, but I think, I think there, there could be something really interesting there. So, um, let's see. So, so that was chemistry. I'll be happy to come back to that if you want to talk more about that in, in terms of the cells. Absolutely. We're, we're diluting. Um, what, it, what I would say is for, uh, for nucleic acid sequencing, I don't worry about dilution. Why? Because I can amplify. I can amplify yeah. everything and I can detect everything. So mm. we're literally detecting the entire genome. We're detecting everything that we believe to be transcribed. Um, whether we look at one cell or a thousand cells, we're, we're seeing the same sets of, of uh, genes being turned on or off. The place where dilution kills us and where we're really limited by sensitivity is when we're looking at proteins and we're also doing some metabolites. Um, there is no amplification there. So, so yes, I would prefer to use smaller droplets. Um, I need to be really careful about whether there's leftover sample on the surface. Um, so far, we don't see leftover sample on the surface, but that may mean that our, our detector just isn't sensitive enough to, to find it. Um, so that's something we worry about a whole lot. And yes, <clears throat> The, the next generation of, of proteomics, if, if you wanted to really change the world, you would come up with a way to do amplification of proteins. That would, uh, sure. that would solve so many problems. Anyway, very good questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wheeler. This is really fascinating. And I wanna just uh, comment a little bit on the, uh, the first question I asked. In fact, I think the, uh, the fact that you can tweak the surface, the interface by electrical potential, changing the surface angle may offer a, a, a really new type of assay, right? It's kind of like spectro spectrometer type of assay by changing the surface angle and change the concentration and the reaction kinetics of the molecules. And that may offer a whole brand new field um, down the road, right? So this, uh, this is my question and um, I'll pass along to the next panelist. So uh, let me try to, uh, that's excellent uh, uh, presentation. I know this is so much work. I can image it only from one group, basically, it's so much. So basically, I think uh, uh, Dr. Swain already talked about uh, uh, the aspect uh, about the chemical and the biology uh, using the DMF, right? So I noticed uh, like uh, your work is still on the, uh, the point of care diagnostics use the small device, right? So uh, Dr. Wheeler, I wanted to know from here, you know, we're talking about a point of care, meaning that uh, the device should be used by the end users. So my like a quick question is, uh, how easy, how hard to run this device right now for the end users? Oh, this is, this such, is my such first a question. question. Such a good question. And first question. Okay. Yeah. We'll get to some yeah. others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all the work I showed there was done by my team. Um, and, and, uh, it would have been very difficult at that time to, to get others to use it. Um, just because, you know, when, when you're building these things and they're not, you know, made by a company and a team of a hundred engineers and ISO certified, uh, mm -hmm. they're just barely at the edge of working. So, so I needed my okay. team to be there to keep everything uh, working and the user interface wasn't that great. What I can okay. say is we are working on this and making them more and more user-friendly. So we have a paper in that recently came out in clinical chemistry in which we did a bunch of blood uh, analyses 
in which at least half of the samples were run by a technician at the hospital who had, you know, when we first met her, she, she had never heard of microfluidics. And, you know, she was a classic, very, very good at her work, but not a, not a microfluidics person. Um, and, and so she, she was able to run it. It, it runs pretty well. Uh, certainly the results she got were, were identical to the results we got. Um, but but I think the larger point of where is this technology appropriate is is part of this question. Um, if you, I, I would always go with the easiest, simplest method. So if you have a lateral flow assay that that you can run and people can use it, I, I would use that. Um, so so I I would think digital microfluidics these these, these kinds of techniques would be better suited for applications in which for whatever reason we haven't been able to develop lateral flow or if we needed more quantitative data. Um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly the kinds of applications where, where CDC is interested, where they don't, they don't just want one person at a time to know who has the, the disease. They actually, they need to, to look at hundreds of people and know immunity. So being mm -hmm. able to go into the field, and, but also do things in parallel, I think is, is, a, is a useful advantage. Um, right, but right. but you are absolutely right that we wouldn't use this for everything. But there's no question. True, true. Like right now, even it's not uh, like uh, ready for the end user, but it's at least uh, provide some angle. Probably in the like a uh, uh, like a uh, uh, for example clinics, the, the physician or this like uh, uh, people with a specific training, they can use that. It's already provide great opportunities, right? So talking about uh, this uh, along this line, basically, I you you said it. Basically, they have uh, some uh, uh, scenarios they really need to use this uh, uh, DMF based assays, meaning that they maybe like uh, need some quantitative analysis data. So can you share your insight about uh, a couple examples related? Like uh, you yeah. only probably some diseases they really need this. Yes, no, that, it's a it's a good point. So so it turns out that um, uh, th there's a whole set of analyses that work great for lateral flow. Um, th these are assays in which analytes are present at nanogram per mil levels. Um, they don't all work great. I mean, lateral flow is still very tricky. To get to get the antibodies to work right, so I, I don't want to don't want to give you the false impression there, but but lateral flow, you know, with traditional look by eye that kind of thing, it's a very powerful technology, but there's a whole set of diseases that have analytes that come in at the picogram per mil uh, level, and you're just not going to get your gold nanoparticle based uh, assay by eye system. Uh, on paper to work sure. with that kind of analyte. There's just, there are True. some fundamental limits there. Um, so I, I think the capacity to do more complicated, you know, lots of sample processing. So in, in my experience, the way, the way you get an immunoassay, for example, to work really, really well is you wash. You wash and you wash and you wash and you wash because there's always sample, there's always sample to be detected it's everything else that's causing the problem. Um, mm -hmm. So, so assays in, that gotcha. require lots of sample processing, and, and in particular, I think these these assays with with uh, analytes at low detection limits uh, mm -hmm. or uh, pre present at low amounts, um, I, I think are attractive areas for this. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, no, may, may I? Have, sorry, Go ahead. sorry, may I have a last question? <laughs> sorry. Oh. So basically, I know, like Dr. Willer, so big, I saw again a lot of uh, good applications uh, like try to integrate uh, all these uh, functionalities into a small amount of the uh, footprint device, right? So uh, would you mind to share your experience uh, talking about uh, the, the, the most challenging part of incorporating these functionalities? I think because I asked this question, we have a like a broad readership in this platform. Uh, people may interested. The people probably they want to get into the field, but they don't know how to do. Like uh, they cannot foresee anything basically from here. Oh, thank you for for raising that. I mean, I 
that's that's the fun thing about these problems is you need everyone, right? I, I'm a chemist. I think about things in chemical terms, um, but <laughs> the the engineers who develop the the optical modules, the the kind of industrial engineers who think about um, the user experience. I, I don't have, I don't, I don't think about that at all, and I certainly don't know how to think about it quantitatively. Um, I, nearly any expertise I can think of in in science and technology, um, you could find a role in this type of of, of project, um, and and that's that's I think again that's one of the fun things about microfluidics and this this these these areas of interdisciplinary um, uh, applications. I think that's a fun thing about ICANX. I mean, this is a chance to talk to people all over the world, you know, from just a vast uh, set of different backgrounds. Um, so, so how do you integrate it? I don't know. I, I, um, I, I've certainly just had the good fortune how to recruit, you know, uh, people with different expertise into my group. We've had some wonderful collaborations with people uh, who have expertise outside of, uh, of of what I have in my lab. Um, I think. I think we as researchers and scientists and, and, and engineers do a really good job of, of working with each other. I wish, for example, uh, politicians around the world could learn from us a little bit. Uh, sure. But, um, yeah. but it, it absolutely is a problem that, that, that requires uh, lots and lots of interesting expertise. Sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. Very good. Thank um, you very much, Dr. Willa. Yeah. All right. Well, last but not least, I hope. Uh, thanks for the amazing <laughs> talk, Dr. Wheeler. Um, it was really like science fiction uh, what you presented. <laughs> so uh, most of my questions have been asked by the rest. So uh, I guess I have just one last question, actually. Um, so I, I'm a nano person, and um, seeing your devices is, looks cool. Um, but they're, to me, they look like they're in a millimeter scale. Um, are there any benefits in scaling down your devices uh, for microfluidics? And can digital microfluidics perform at those levels? Yeah, so that, this is such an interesting question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just barely in the microfluidic regime, aren't I? Um, so, so digital microfluidics certainly uh, works at much smaller scale. And, um, uh, our challengers from Duke, uh, so Richard Fair's group has done some very nice work at, at Duke with, um, with with 10 micron uh, per side electrode. So, so working with, uh, I think that ends up being 100 picoliters or maybe 50 picoliters. So, so it is totally doable. Um, they're much more complicated experiments. Um, uh, as you might imagine, evaporation is is a killer in those kinds of experiments. So, so you need to be, it, it's a different set of experimental challenges, but they're totally worth, I think, exploring. Um, that, that just doesn't have, that happens to be a place that I haven't explored yet, but, but there is so much uh, uh, interesting things that could be explored. The capacity, you know, uh, these, these droplets and channels, such a powerful technique you know, parallel or well, series, I guess, series, thousands of droplets. What a powerful technique. But what you can't do is you can't say droplet number 37, go react with droplet number 55. That's that's not a thing. I mean, people are working and there's some work in that area, but it's 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 very challenging. So the capacity to do that on picoliter droplets, um, uh, working with one particle at a time, you know, doing some some interesting nano interface thing. Uh, I, I think would be just a no-brainer. That would be so exciting. Um, but it, it needs to be you. So I, I hope you can do it. <laughs> I would imagine that uh, at those length scales, um, you know, your electric field could even start causing your analytes to absorb to the surface. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting question. Um, absolutely. The, the electric field is there and things are happening. What I will say is I'll, I'll remind you, this isn't an electrophoresis situation, right? Because uh, we're not passing a lot of current through the droplet. Um, the electric field is mostly dropping across the dielectric. Um, so there, sure, absolutely, there should be some surface charge effects that, that might have 
uh, influence, but it's not as if we're, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of electrophoresis happening. Um, so I, again, I think that's an area uh, that, that could be explored that, that could just lead to some really interesting things. Mm -hmm. Right, thank very you. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, before we get to the end, I think we have um, one very interesting question from the audience, and I, I, I think I should ask, ask it. Before I also have one, one of mine, but it, it depends if we have a few minutes. Um, I, we had this question from uh, Dongyu Jiang. Uh, he's asking, what is the benefit of using digital microfluidics for single cell sequencing? Because I think the mm -hmm. impact there is so important. And that, that's why I wanted to make sure that the audience gets to hear what the big advantages are from there. The potential is amazing. Oh, and I... Uh... I think that's a really important question. I think it's really important. Yeah, on the one hand, I think we as scientists, you should do interesting things. And, and, and the impact may not be known, right? The first person who made the first transistor couldn't imagine where we are today. So, so I think you should do curiosity-driven work just to see what's possible. But on the other hand, when you write the paper, I want to see you make some realistic claims about what you've done so far, and mm -hmm. and I want and you need you need to compare it to the other technologies that that may be well ahead and may have substantial advantages. So the question is, why would we do single cell sequencing this way? And my answer would be, if you don't care about uh, the the phenotype of the cell in uh, in the sample. Um, if what you really want to do is take a sample of tissue, digest it into individual cells, and learn about the heterogeneity, you absolutely should use 10x genomics, and you should uh, get the, the sequences from thousands of cells, and that is the way to go. So the only reason to use a technique like the one I presented today is if you're interested in the particular challenges that we, we saw, which are um, with the 10x technique, I don't know why the transcriptome of this cell and that cell are different if they're influencing each other. With, mm -hmm. with our technique, we're looking very specifically at cells next to each other. Uh, how are they influencing each other? And, and that's, um, that, that's, that's really the, the point is that you, you need to think carefully about what your question is. And, and absolutely, the answer is not always the same technology. Um, so, so you really want to think about your question. Uh, and may, may I may I just uh, piggyback on the uh, make a comment on this? And one thing immediately mm -hmm. come to mind is um, because of the ease and the flexibility that you can send in reagent to prepare different um, libraries, and it's probably give you a digital microfluid gives you a, a you know an easier way to simultaneously measure different omics, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Running from genomics to transcriptomics to protomics, which may not be that easy using um, droplets microfluid way. Yeah. That, that's absolutely yeah. right. So you're you're stuck with you're putting a barcode in and you're doing next generation sequencing. There's no way to take your broken emulsion of a thousand cells and do anything other than next generation sequencing. Um, whereas we we're still self-contained all the way through the process, so we can go do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And and uh, very quickly, very brief uh, question here. Um, have you have you thought about uh, using the digital microfluidics to measure and, and track uh, reactions that involve change in viscosity, for example, polymerization. If I want to optimize um, uh, how I synthesize my polymers, I can set up a library of so many droplets and then just use the speed, the flow rate, uh, and, and, and that can tell how much the polymerization has occurred. And also, I can, I can also, have you thought about even uh, making Situations where you make a single strand, like a homopolymer versus block polymer, so other architectures, and comparing how those two are performing under the same condition. Because I, I saw that it's a that platform could be beautiful for combinatorial polymerization to optimize uh, the the reaction condition. Have you thought about that, Martin? This is this is such a, an interesting idea. We we have been the great thing about saying my measurement is going to be velocity is mm -hmm. now we don't even need a detector. <laughs> I'm, I'm always, I'm already measuring velocity. Um, so, so we've done some coagulation work. 
We've we've done a, a few other things where we're changing viscosity on the fly. We haven't done anything with polymerization, so uh, that would be really a really fun project to think about. Um, and and fr frankly, it's not something I know much about. But but if there were a reason to want to go make libraries and and uh, see how the viscosity is changing, uh, I think it could be could be a very interesting technique. For that. I, I think you have somebody here who can enjoy that very much, the, uh, Professor Chang. Uh, it can do the, the polymerization and institute cell self assembly. Uh, his, his work uh, on uh, making these beautiful polymers and then self assembling to create nano domains. I think the two of you should have a conversation because I believe there's something beautiful there uh, where he can create libraries of polymer, not only study the polymerization, but also their self assembly in situ with the optical detector. And, and that was my I completely comment. agree. That was my. That would be amazing. My, yeah, it, it would be. It, it would change the feel. That feel completely. Yep. All right. Uh, Sounds great. Yeah. So very very nice. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really fascinating talk. I wish we had more time, <laughs> but I have to jump to another forum. Uh, uh, and I know Alice is waiting for me on the other end. So I I want to share very quickly. Um, something that we always do here at ICANX. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Wheeler, for joining us. Uh, and I want to present you this digital certificate uh, for presenting our uh, volume 123. If we were in a normal time where we are in a conference, Alice and I would walk across the, the, the podium and give it to you, but we will share with you uh, electronically. And I want to thank all the panelists and please join us next week as we look at uh, controlling atomic placement in uh, Nano manufacturing from uh, Professor Chen, and uh, this will be the panel, and the moderator is going to be uh, Chris Nyhouse from University of Twente. And I want to thank you all. Um, thank you, ICANX, and have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>